Hello, I'm here on behalf of a team from uh, Warsaw. Uh, we are part of the Clarion project. Uh, so for the beginning, uh, I wanted to just share a little bit of information about uh, our project and what we do uh, in Poland. And uh, for anyone that is not aware, um, Clarion uh, Poland is uh, basically has started around 2013, if I'm correct, uh, more or less. And uh, we have managed to finish one part of the project and we have, we're just beginning uh, our second part. Um, so the first part of the project was mostly uh, concentrating on creating the infrastructure, on setting up all the tools and services. And this talk is going to be mostly technical. So there are a few applications that we have managed to, uh, uh, I mean, there are a few projects we have managed to use our tools on so far, but uh, this is mostly going to be on uh, things that we have set up. Uh, so there's uh, various teams in the project and uh, Doing, dealing with most various topics like uh, ling related to linguistics, uh, social linguistics. There's even a little bit about language translation. Um, but uh, our team in uh, Warsaw is uh, dealing with uh, speech. And um, basically the motivation uh, for uh, obvious, uh, which should probably be obvious to most people uh, here, the motivation for doing such research is because a lot of data that uh, exist um, is mostly in, uh, is sometimes in the form of uh, pure audio, and for most human uh, hu uh, humanities and social sciences researchers, this can be a really difficult uh, thing to handle because processing such data can be quite expensive. Using uh, translations uh, or transcription services can be expensive. Uh, but even if somebody wants to do it themselves because they don't have any funding at all, uh, can take a lot of time and requires a lot of knowledge and know-how, uh, especially in um, sort of uh, challenging languages like Polish because the technology is still not there. It is not as ubiquitous as, for example, in English or German. So um, this is why we try to provide these services for free so anybody, everybody would have access to them. Uh, we have mostly two areas that we concentrate on, and this is, uh, we kind of separate this into data and tools. Uh, and we do have a website set up for anyone uh, who wants to see. So far the website is in Polish because this is uh, like in the first part of the project we wanted to set everything up, but we are working on translating it into English as well. Um, so uh, the first part of my presentation is going to be on data and um, uh, the kind of motivations, again, for creating uh, um, data is uh, because uh, w when we started working, uh, we already had quite an experience uh, with creating uh, various tools. Uh, and we're aware also that we're not the only one who should be making these tools in Poland. Uh, so uh, the situation currently is that a lot of the data for creating these tools uh, to process speech is actually very expensive and hard to get. Some of it uh, is um, commercial and obviously costs a lot of money. But even the stuff that is created in recent, fairly recently in projects like MetaNet and uh, so on is pretty domain limited and cannot be really used for uh, making generic high quality tools. So our goals was to create uh, kind of the first completely free general purpose speech corpus for creating like these baseline tools that can be later used to adapt to specific domains. Um, so, um, and also one, one, one remark is that, well, there's obviously data available for free because you can always uh, download it from, you know, various websites and so on. Uh, the problem with that is that it is usually also restricted. So the, the way we decided to create our corpus was uh, basically, um, well, what is kind of very well known today in uh, speech technology communities to basically record a red corpus to invite as many people as we can to, to the studio uh, and uh, this way we kind of got everyone's uh, consent to actually publish this data for one and uh, also 
and the data is not in any way personal or related to the speakers. So um, the corpus that we created uh, is, well, compared to the last presentation, it doesn't seem like a lot. 56, 56 hours may seem like a small number, but it is actually quite sufficient to create some uh, pretty decent tools, especially because the quality is very uh, uh, controlled uh, in this situation. Uh, and we also created a little smaller subcorpus that was uh, uh, cr uh, recorded uh, over a telephony kind of uh, um, uh, situations because the acoustic environment there is uh, completely different and there are some use cases that uh, call for uh, analyzing such data. Uh, so the, the main purpose of this corpus was to, cr to develop speech tools, speech processing tools, so in and itself it's not uh, maybe very valuable resource for humanities research apart from maybe some very low level phonetics research and stuff like that. Uh, nevertheless, we are releasing it uh, in two forms. One of them is uh, a, a very popular system called uh, M e EMU, EMU, I'm not sure, um, uh, that uh, currently is released in an in a old kind of format that you had to download uh, a program and install locally on your computer um, and download the whole database, which is a few gigabytes, and it's not really maybe convenient for all the users. But we are currently working in something that is, uh, uh, as I have learned, uh, really popular also among other uh, uh, participants of the project, and that is to use the web interface, which should be really convenient thing for people where you could just log in to the website and browse the data directly on the website. Um, uh, furthermore, there is also this, uh, this service also has some really interesting uh, connections to the uh, R statistics package, uh, which allows to do some really nice uh, and easy um, hypothesis testing and so on on the data. And we also are releasing the uh, speech recognition toolkit uh, completely uh, prepared uh, for download. Basically, the way this works, these are some of the results, just uh, some of the baseline results that you can get from the system. But basically, the way it works is for the technical-minded people, all you have to do is just clone a repository, practically run a single command, and after a couple of hours, depending on the computer you have, you can get a completely working system to set up locally, or maybe to do some kind of research and uh, tweaking uh, for some specific use. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, this, this speech uh, corpus was mostly done for creating tools, but we are working now, we have started working uh, uh, mostly with other partners of the project on creating some domain-specific corpora, and uh, a couple of them uh, shown here is uh, a corpus of spontaneous speech, uh, which is quite a challenging task because uh, the recording quality on such corpora is usually very questionable. They are usually recorded um, semi-hidden, so uh, people may not even be aware that they are being recorded at the current moment. That, that, that is because the microphone is not really in clear view. So, so the quality of these recordings is very challenging, but we are going to do our best to kind of annotate as much as the data, as much of this data as possible. Uh, apart from that, we have uh, something that is really popular among uh, researchers, and this is the parliamentary data. Uh, and finally, we also have um, a collection of historical videos, which are kind of like uh, news segments that you would find um, played uh, in in the, from like the early, maybe even the 50s and 60s all the way until today uh, that would talk about current events. And this, this seems to be a very um, useful resource for several reasons. For one, it doesn't seem to be as complicated to uh, automatically process because it has usually a single um, person speaking uh, about the, these events. And second of all, it does have a really wide historical context, and there's a lot of interesting information that can be uh, extracted from that. And for the second part of the uh, presentation, uh, I'm going to kind of glance over these things. Uh, uh, we have obviously released all these uh, tools, and um, 
services uh, for people to use. And our kind of idea was to start from basically everything that we have. And maybe this isn't a very uh, kind of uh, smart thing to do, uh, but we basically looked at the speech processing tool chain that we kind of usually use to um, extract data from, uh, from audio. And um, we kind of took the several, apart from just giving the transcription, we kind of took the sever several intermediary steps and also kind of uh, um, provided them as services for anyone to use if they want uh, separately. Uh, so these tools included, maybe it's not very visible on that slide, uh, but these tools, tools include things like uh, grapheme to phoneme uh, conversion, uh, speech alignment, uh, speaker diarization, voice activity detection, keyword spotting, and finally something that we didn't really plan to do, but uh, we are currently uh, working on is uh, actual speech transcription. Uh, there are other initiatives in Clarion that are uh, actually working on these things as well. I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of technical details. I'm just going to mention, because of the time limitations, what these two actually do. So grapheme to phoneme conversion is obviously conversion from the orthographic to phonetic uh, alphabet, something that is fairly simple to do in Polish using uh, a finite set of rules, uh, except for, obviously, all the exceptions that occur in noisy textual data and foreign words and so on. So. Uh, most of it works fairly well, but we have to do a lot of exception to deal with these uh, foreign languages and, uh, and noise occurring in the data. Uh, the most useful tool, uh, the most well-working tool, in our opinion, is obviously uh, speech segmentation. So uh, I use this term text-to-speech alignment because it's usually more in easy to understand for uh, humanities researchers. Um, so basically, if we do have audio and text that we can fairly uh, accurately give uh, uh, an alignment of when each word and even phoneme occurs in this uh, audio segment. And this does work fairly well even for uh, long audio. Um, voice activity detection uh, is something that is uh, kind of a standard component of any speech recognition process. Uh, and we do have some uh, extra tweaks that could be useful to people, but this is a fairly uh, not very not very often requested tool. Uh, speaker diarization, is something that is more interesting to people, and people have asked for such tools. So basically, uh, there are several levels that you could detect speakers. You have speaker change detection, speaker diarization, or even speaker identification. Well, we don't do actual speaker identification. We don't actually know who is speaking at the moment, but uh, we do try to at least say that uh, the same speaker, whoever it is, occurs several times in, in one piece of recording. And this, this could be useful to, to some people that we talk to. Uh, keyword detection in this case is basically just a slightly simpler version of speech transcription. If people are only interested in finding certain keywords, then this is a slightly easier task because we can get a little bit, well, depending on the keyword, we can get uh, a little bit better results for detecting a specific keyword than detecting every word in the sentence. So, um, but this works mostly the same way as finally speech trans uh, transcription, which is one of the most requested uh, tools, obviously, for a lot of researchers. Uh, and the problem here is that uh, this tool re to, to work accurately, it does require uh, a lot of adaptation. Uh, so here are a couple of applications that we have managed uh, to do. So we did work on, on the, on the uh, spontaneous speech corpus. Uh, we also had uh, an, a project with a, the Institute of Applied Linguistics uh, to work on uh, some data that they were recording for re-speaking that I can mention if anybody is interested. Uh, and we have made attempts to transcribe things like social science interviews, uh, which we actually had, uh, uh, well, it wasn't very easy just, uh, just to, to say, but uh, we did manage to, uh, in some specific cases, to actually provide some tools that do work for such data. So for future plans, we do intend to add additional corpora to process uh, this additional corpora to um, uh, 
adapt our tools uh, for various domains. And we generally have a strategy where uh, we try to first talk to the people uh, and ask for their data and then provide them with some working solutions. Um, we want to also improve some of the usability um, issues uh, with these services because we recognize that this is also a very big problem. And um, um, we basically want to kind of facilitate, create more cooperation with partners. So we are actively looking for people in the community uh, to, to work with. And we do get emails occasionally, so this isn't uh, very difficult, fortunately. Uh, and we're hope, we hope that this is going to get uh, better with time. Thank you. Thank you very much for interesting talk and packing so much, so many information and activities in, in, in 15 minutes. Uh, so please, questions. Uh, yes, please. Okay, well, thanks. Um, I was wondering, the parliamentary uh, scorpus, is that uh, transcribed completely by the people from the government? And if so, to what extent? I mean, is that a verbatim transcription or is that a transcription in correct uh, grammatically correct Polish. Um, so yes. how different is the, the real speech and the transcription? Uh, that's a very good question. Well, the, the point is, the, the, the reason that people use the parliamentary data is obviously because this is one of the few resources that is available completely legally for free because a lot of the legislation allows uh, and even demands such data to be available and made to the public. Uh, and yes, the problem is that this data is uh, the transcriptions that we find from, from the uh, government, the official transcriptions, are usually not 100% accurate. Fortunately, we do have a way to deal with this data as far as creating tools. Um, and, and this means that uh, we can uh, extract segments which uh, do match the text and use only these segments for actually creating the tools. Um, this still means that uh, if such a resource is to be used uh, uh, as kind of like a, resource, a research resource, uh, that um, these segments, well, uh, the things that are misaligned will either have to be automatically recognized, which will introduce additional errors, or manually checked. So, so this is something that we do take into account. A lot of things like swear words are obviously often omitted. Uh, a lot of discussions, and some things are even impossible to, to transcribe because these things are, are delivered in PDF format, and when several people speak at the same time, this is obviously un impossible to kind of annotate or transcribe okay. accurately. So this, these are things that we, we do take into account, and well, uh, if, if there is nothing else that we can do, we will at least uh, mark these areas of uh, low confidence, uh, specifically in the data, so people will know which things they can count on and which are kind of not very certain. Okay. Yeah. Uh, please introduce yourself. Cla Cla in Lithuania, Andrew Sutka. You mentioned about secretly recorded uh, speech. How yes. did you solve the legal issues with that? Uh, yes. Are you allowed to do that in the first place? Uh, first of all, yes, this is, this is something that uh, we are cooperating with a partner from uh, Wuj. I'm not sure if uh, he is here currently, uh, and he can give you a lot of details about how this was done. But uh, as far as I was made aware, uh, this whole process was made legally in such a way that the people were informed that they are going to be recorded in the future, but they weren't informed exactly when to keep the whole... Uh, experiment as spontaneous as possible. So they did give an approval before being recorded, but it may have passed like maybe several weeks even before they actually got recorded. And, and afterwards they would sign the appropriate releases and everything to, to kind of deal with this issue. So that was kind of the protocol done for it. But again, if, if you want more details, I can refer you to the right person. Um, another question is, about the language model, um, what I was missing is um, if you are going to, get, uh, to add some service where the, the humanities scholars and social science scholars can add documents related to the interview, so to improve the, um, well, uh, the, the recognition rate, 
causing less out of vocabulary uh, stuff and things like that. I mean, I, I believe that's really for the interviews that you mentioned, it's crucial that you have a dedicated uh, language model. Are you planning to make such an, a web service where people can upload down uh, documents used for the improved uh, recognition? That, that's a very good idea, actually. Uh, for now, we are working this more in an offline manner. So whenever somebody comes and says, I've used your service, it sucks, it doesn't work. We say, well, okay, let's talk. And uh, we kind of try to figure out what's, what's wrong. Uh, and then do all the things that you mentioned. Uh, making an actual service that would be able to adapt to the user is kind of an involved task, but this is something that uh, is kind of planned and we hope to do as much of it as possible. And this isn't only about the language modeling and vocabulary, but also the acoustic side of things. So we, you would have to both uh, kind of create a service that can, uh, well, there are a lot of technical issues. It's not only about um, providing the data, but you also have to allow people to select the appropriate models in the interface and stuff like that. So now kind of gets involved and complicated uh, for users. So we are trying to figure out what would be the easiest uh, system to create from the usability side, right? So that people would know how to use these things. Uh, and this is something that we're still kind of researching to, to find the uh, optimal solution. Hi, Zofia Marisk, ETH Stockholm. So I'd like to commend you very much on uh, doing such a, such a comprehensive effort in Poland because we have, uh, of course, I'm aware of some ASR systems in, in Poland uh, that were developed there, but due to uh, proprietary complications and, or other issues, issues they are not really available in here, uh, we have a chance to have something where people are also involved in, in promoting speech technology and, and uh, making it available, right? Uh, so, um, but the problem I see in Poland is uh, uh, these days there are lots of projects. So I was a little bit uh, surprised that you said that there are no corpora or spoken corpora. It, it's difficult. It's actually difficult to access them and to encourage uh, linguists to 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 work with you, basically, right? So I don't know if it's a question to you. Uh, it's more, um, um, or maybe it's to Clarin, the Polish Clarin. Um, whether there will be some activities in, in marketing uh, this type of, I mean, speech processing to, mm -hmm. to linguists who are sitting currently on a lot of data that they are painstakingly undertaking over years and years, which is not necessary, right? Mm -hmm. Or will not be necessary very soon. Yes, well, I can make a couple of comments on that. That uh, uh, Obviously, uh, as far as the speech tools and the data, uh, there have been uh, several uh, projects that have managed to create some of these, uh, um, some of this resource. And because of the, well, you could you could argue how much of it is legal issues and how much of it is mentality. Uh, a lot of this data was not made available, but this isn't uh, only exclusive to Poland. I think a lot of countries uh, have problems with this and. For the last maybe maybe until something like a decade ago, uh, it was not very easy to get any substantial amount of data for free, even for English. So if somebody wanted to get into speech research, they would have to have at least uh, some kind of financial backing to to get the right resources. This thing is rapidly changing, and I, I am seeing this change in Poland. Obviously, the projects that were created on old rules. Uh, will not be able to release data, but one thing that I hope that will change and that is visible generally in like the machine learning environment is that at least the models created on this data will be made available. And this is something that we're ho hoping that even if people are not willing to relinquish the actual data, that at least we'll have the ability to kind of share the results in some way or form from uh, these large data sets. Poland was quite under-resourced until recently, uh, until maybe a couple of uh, decades ago, which was kind of confirmed in various uh, publications. But uh, it is still on kind of the positive side of things compared to a lot of other, other languages. So we're, we're working on these things constantly.
If I may comment, I may add something. Uh, it's a difficult to change mentality of people who think that their, their, uh, the research data are a treasure on which they can build their career. So, so it's difficult to convince them to opening the data. However, we uh, try to, uh, to, act, to offer to the users, potential users, researchers, our uh, free of charge help in, in the processing the data. And also we try to develop a model in which the corpus is still uh, pro uh, under some protection of, of copyrights, but you can access is uh, in a, for research via, for example, our cloud in logging, and, and there is a recent change in the Polish law concerning copyrights that opens quite interesting possibilities. And even we just signed a, a first agreement with one of the projects, uh, not on speech, but on, on um, also on, on, on text material, but with the same problem of, of uh, copyright. So this is go so our model of, of distributed uh, uh, authorization seems to be now very compatible with the newest changes in, in Polish uh, law. Oh yes, we have just run out of, of the, oh, last one questions. I'll try to be quick about it. It's mainly a comment to what was just said. Uh, we've spent rather a lot of time trying to figure out ways of using copyrighted or secret materials um, in terms of making derivations of it, right? The same way that you in uh, text language technology often make trigrams or something available of newspaper texts. Um, it, this might work for us, but and, and uh, if it does, we'll we'll share it with Clarin. Um, there is one there is one danger here, I think, when when we spend rather a lot of time and money on this. Uh, in Sweden, there are several lawsuits now by anti-piracy uh, uh, corporations that are targeting people who have used other people's texts in order to remake something. So they're targeting directly language technology, for example, and claiming that, look, I wrote those books, so I should have some stake in the monies you can earn from language models based on them. This is ridiculous, of course. It's a little bit like saying if I tear down those walls and I make a sculpture out of it, then the architect should be paid for the sculpture. That's ridiculous, but this is actually happening, and some of these lawsuits are, are gaining ground. So I, I think we should be a bit vocal about the rights and non-rights of, of, of ownership here. Uh, when we're doing derivatives, that, that should clearly be derivatives and it should not be owned by the people that spoke or wrote things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much once again for speaking.